Okay, welcome to another episode of Sunday Cooking with Sauces Best. I actually tried to look like a little something today, y'all, to the point where, again, always say this, if I'm cooking professionally, the hair, of course, is going to be back, you know, not going to let it flow, but I'm just cooking at home today, and at home, on camera, I've chosen today to be cute, so it is not back in a ponytail, but when cooking professionally, hair net, chef's hat, ponytail okay but today the menu is going to be cheesy meatloaf italian style infused with italian bread crumbs pesto tomatoes and a mint i'm going to walk you over so you can see what i'm doing to get the tomato sauce part of it started of course it is still going to contain some ketchup on top but mainly just to thicken the other sauce i'm going to make I know everybody hates like these awful versions of white mac and cheese that you get from restaurants. They usually lack flavor and such, but today I'm making an Alfredo mac and cheese. So it's still going to look white, of course, and it's going to have lots of crispy bacon throughout and going to be topped with food processed bacon and cheese flavored crackers to make the bread crust. I'm also making collard and turnip green mix with smoked meat in it. And so that's today's dinner. I forgot one more thing for dessert. I am making rice pudding. However, my family hates raisins. So we're using dried cranberries in the place of that. So y'all come back in a bit, but right now we're going to move on to the start of what's going to be your tomato sauce for your meatloaf. All right. So we're over in the other part of my kitchen. Um, hair starting to look a little crazy. Okay, so let me just show you what we got here. I used about, I guess, four good sized tomatoes. Oh, my hair is really acting crazy. <clears throat> See, we got all those diced fresh tomatoes in. All right, so the next thing we're going to do, let me get something to make it come out easier. I'm gonna get a knife that's how I always do it anyway and I need to put my apron on too in between this video and the next one that I come out here and do to show you how to mix up the meatloaf and stuff I'm trying to keep my chef jackets clean I've got one that I have totally wrecked to the point where I probably take that thing to the cleaners to get it clean um, so one can of contadina tomato paste And then next, I love this company's tomato products. Uh, Cento tomato puree, excellent. I'm gonna pour some of that in, actually the whole can as well, because I make a pretty big meatloaf when I do make meatloaf, all right? I've got a trash bag right here. Toss this into the sink. And we're just gonna put that in there. When you we'll mix this up, real quick all right and we're going to turn the burner on but we're going to let it cook on low because you definitely don't want tomato cooking on high you always cook tomato on low um so yeah that anyone else ever notice when you get a lighter colored wig like blonde or pink no matter what you do no matter how much you oil it it just frizz city hate it but i love the color I have oiled and brushed this thing like twice today because I went to the grocery store this morning to get a few other components I needed. I will be making a video, by the way, for St. Patty's. I've already got the corned beef brisket in the freezer. Haven't done the shopping for the other components yet. But I'm going to make a really colorful, mainly green menu. We're going to turn lots of things green. It's going to be pretty cool. So here's what you should have. You're going to put your top on it and you're going to let that do what it does here. All right, so now I'm going to take you guys over with me real quick. I'm going to stop again. Okay, so because of the amount of greens we have, I'm only going to use, hold on one second. I'm 
gonna use one bundle of the collar, and then I'm gonna put up the rest of them for another Sunday dinner. As you all know, you can freeze greens. I don't know if you know that, but you can. So what I'm going to do real, real quick here, so I can put these away for freezing real quick, is we're just going to cut the stems off of them so I can get them in the bag easier. I have another trash bag at this workstation too. It just makes things easier to throw things away to go. All right. Put the stems for that in there. I'm going to throw those away. Then we're going to bag these greens up. I did just put them in the freezer. I keep forgetting I have two freezers now. Ha! Still trying to remember that. Makes things a lot easier to put away. All right? Get some paper towel. Clean up this mess real quick. So, just a few of the things I put into my greens. Um, I personally, into my greens, add garlic, fresh garlic. I also add liquid smoke to them. And I also add smoked turkey parts to them. Um, and then I usually add seasonings such as Old Bay, uh, salt, pepper, uh, orange pepper or lemon pepper, whichever one you prefer, and vinegar. Of course, vinegar. And to get your greens really tender a lot faster. Oh, and onion powder. And also um, some baking soda. Not to be confused with baking powder that we use for baking, okay? You want to use baking soda. And yeah, I know you're like, baking soda and vinegar, yes, it's going to create a little bit of volcano action in your pot for a minute, but it's never overflowed on me yet. That's how my grandma made, her, made hers, that's how I was taught to make them. So, yeah, that's what, that's what we do. That's how we're doing it. I need a bigger cutting board, huh? But I don't like to cut my greens up real fine. I chop them, but I like to kind of leave mine in larger pieces because it's going to cook down. I hate like those little tiny skinny greens on a plate. It bothers me. I don't like to eat my greens like that. I want my greens nice and big. One second. <clears throat> So we're just going to grab a plastic bag to put them in as we chop because I still got other greens to cut up and put them on here. We got the turnips to do. Got the turnips to do, folks. So we're just putting these in here. We're going to rinse them, of course, before we cook them to get all the dirt out. Okay? Don't forget that part. You're not gonna see me do it because you know the video will be two hours if I showed you every step. But yes, wash your greens, folks. Wash your greens. <clears throat> all right. So let's get all of this. All right. So we're setting those aside. We're throwing the stems away. Sometimes I cook the stems too, but I'm not doing that today. If you're pressure cooking. You can do it that way because they'll get soft enough and they won't be a problem. But when we're just trying to cook them on top of the stove like I'm doing today, and they're not going to be so pleasant to people that way. All right. Turnips. This is a smaller, finer grain. These are little guys. 
smaller than the others. This is trash now. Well, this in the trash. <clears throat> That's gonna snip this stuff off using my butcher scissors. <clears throat> These stems are a lot, lot, lot finer. You could probably leave them on if you wanted to. You know, you could. I don't know if you want to or not, but you could. Get my handy dandy sharp chef's knife here. I'm just gonna start doing the same thing. Chop, chop, chop. You can even feel the difference in when you chop them. They're not nearly as crisp and as hard. It's almost like cutting through cabbage versus cutting through collard. Just want to keep cutting those, keep cutting them. So you see the general idea. <clears throat> and I think I am going to end up throwing this down just to have space in the pot. Although I am using a huge pot. It might be okay, but you know, time. <laughs> time too. Because the more you put in there, the longer it's going to take to cook. And we don't want to be 10 o'clock tonight eating Sunday dinner. So I'm going to grab all these stems. Here. All right, so you see what you have here. I'm not going to try to get these in the bag too, but what we are going to do is like rinse and wash them all, and we're going to get this going, but yeah. Sunday dinner on the way, folks. And I'm going to go put my apron on, too, because we're going to get into some messy stuff here shortly. Okay, everyone. One second. <laughs> I had to go grab my apron, because just like that, I had forgotten to put it on. Okay. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to get this meatloaf ready to go in the oven. I'll show you those steps. Then I got to make a food uh, liquor store run. Because if you live here in Georgia, you know, can't buy anything early in the morning. And I went to the grocery store earlier thinking, hey, I'm just going to get something now. No, that wasn't what was happening. So I got to go back. So let me get prepared here. two jars of pesto now let me tell you why one for the meat in the meat one to go on top of the meat when it's baking sounds crazy but it's gonna be really really good you're gonna be like that was a really good idea so you don't put that in until you've got all your meat in all right so just gonna take those off and we're also going to quickly throw that on the floor because it's leaking and contaminating stuff so hold on So just so you can see what I'm getting ready to use to get that up, it's Libman Disinfectant Cleaner. It kills 99% of germs and viruses. We do not want to leave that. That is bad, bad, bad. <clears throat> All right. I'm also going to go spray some of this on my hands and wash my hands as well. You want to make sure you got the entire surface. I'm going to use the paper towel to pick up the bag that's on the floor so I'm not directly touching it. We're going to take this over and then we'll wash my hands again. Can see, we 
got it on its own thing here. Got some paper towel under it in case that happens again. Got some seasoning there. All right, let's give this a try again. Nothing like kitchen bloopers, is there? You just gotta be real careful with stuff like that because you can make yourself and others sick. You don't want to ever do that as a cook. Chef, whatever it is that you label yourself. I'm gonna lay that knife off to the side too. Now let's touch this. Wash it before we use it on anything else. Keep this on that surface that we created for it. <clears throat> okay, now this is when we are gonna get in here with our hands. We're just gonna start putting it in. It's a lot of ground beef, but I make a big meatloaf. All right, break it as much as you can because there's gonna be other ingredients going into this. And so you want it easy to use. <clears throat> also make sure you're not getting any of that paper towel into your food, although luckily, hopefully you won't have to do that. That's unusual. Usually when I buy these loaves, and you want to buy, like if you're cooking for someone professionally, <laughs> normally you buy a higher grade of beef than this. You wouldn't buy this for cooking for someone unless they tell you it's okay to use it, I guess. But um, on a family budget, just for my family, this is ideal. But normally, I buy the much better uh, ground beef that the butcher has actually ground up if you're cooking for someone else. All right. I left my largest mixing bowl back in Maryland when I was there recently. I could not pack it and bring it back. So I'm working with this little itty bitty thing. I'm going to move the bowl to this thing too just in case any goes off the sides of the bowl Ooh. all right so you want to get that in there i'm gonna get some gloves for this next part because we are about to do some meat massaging with eggs and all kinds of stuff that I do not want touching my hands and don't like the feeling of either. And so, yep, we're gonna put these on, get them on correctly. And then we're gonna move on to the next part of this process. Now, the way I do my meatloaf, I let it cook first without any of the toppings on it. And then I come back halfway through the cooking process and do all that and i usually cook my meatloaf covered in foil at first also so that nothing burns and i think we're going to put the rest of this beef back because we are not going to need that show y'all leave it out because it's going to be part of breakfast tomorrow we'll not leave it out but i'll put it in the fridge instead of the freezer all right and you see that paper towel on the floor with the blood? I can't touch that now and pick that up because of this. But yeah, when we're done with this, that's going to be thrown away. All right. So we got this here. Time to get some very important things in here. Bread crumbs. Got to get your bread crumbs in. I like using a generous amount because I like my meatloaf to almost taste like a giant meatball. So breadcrumbs are important to me. You use as many as you like, but it gives it nice texture. I remember my grandma used to make her meatloaf actually by crumbling up um, toasted bread. I don't believe in working that hard, folks. So we're going to do it with some breadcrumbs. I work that hard when I have to, but when I don't have to, I'm not going to. And this just gets it more evenly distributed, too, than that good old-fashioned way with that toasted bread. How many times y'all hate grandmother's meatloaf and there's hunks of bread in there? <laughs> it might be delicious hunks of bread, but wouldn't it have been nicer if it was just a smoother mix like this? Of course it would have been. So we're just gonna keep doing this, making sure we get it through. All right, I think we got it. I always check the bottom, yikes. See, that's why your surface has to be clean so that if you lose some, you can put it back in the bowl. That's why I made sure to sanitize after that incident when we first opened the meat. 
you gotta keep your surface clean. It should be so clean, literally, that you can eat off of it. That little piece, we're not gonna worry about. We're gonna put that on chain. We're not mixing that back in. All right, so now, <clears throat> the next thing we wanna do is the eggs. This carton of eggs, I'm throwing away anyway, but normally because you've touched the raw meat, you could not do what I just did. You would have had to change the gloves. But because I'm throwing the container away and the container is not going back in the fridge, we're good. I use two whole eggs and a mixture of about this size. Again, we're gonna try to get everything mixed in real good. Maybe I should have put my hair back because doing you know, this process is getting on my nerves a little bit. But again, cooking professionally, hair would have been back now, not to worry. Hair would have been up with a bandana on or a hairnet or something. All right? Or I would have just worn a shorter wig. I often buy shorter wigs for cooking engagements. That way, don't have to worry about it nearly as much, all right? So we're just getting this all mixed in. We lost a larger peat. We want to get those back in. <clears throat> All right. Make sure you got the eggs through there as much as you could. Ugh. I need a bigger mixing bowl. I'm going to order another one this week because this is not going to work for me in the long run, even here at the house. Too complicated. Like this. Okay. At this point, well, we got one more thing. And again, we're using the whole jar, so you can touch it. But if you were not using a whole jar, you would have had to change gloves. Just want to keep teaching y'all about safety too while I'm teaching you how to do this. Because the safety part is just as important as the recipe. Because you don't want to make people sick. All right? So we got that going. Now we want to mix our pesto throughout. And my tray has decided it wants to run away. I'm trying to pull it back without getting my hands on my surface any dirtier than it is. People are like, why do you keep disinfectant spray hanging up in your cooking area? This is why. Because you keep dropping stuff and you got to clean it as you go. That's exactly why I keep it in this same area. So I don't have far to go when mistakes happen. All right. Get it mixed as good as you can. Like I said, I need a bigger mixing bowl. That would make this a lot easier. Try to get it all off your fingers. One thing I can do is waste some pesto. Pesto is delicious stuff. All right, make sure you got it as evenly mixed in as you can. Like I said, it's not gonna be great in this mixing bowl. All right, so now I'm gonna take this off and this off. All right, we can finally pick that up now. I'm gonna walk everything to the trash and we're also gonna clean our hands again. Larger pan here. Where's it? This one. Get this out of the way. On the shelf. Because we need to clean this area again. This can just go directly to the sink. Go again so you're gonna put other stuff here that you need. Alright. Alright, so where's my tray? Ha! Running around in a circle. We've got our tray. There was one thing I forgot to mix in, <laughs> but we'll do it here when we're molding. <clears throat> Cause you gotta mold your meatloaf into a meatloaf, right? Right. Alright. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what 
What I've got here is food processed onion and white garlic. I mean, I'm sorry, garlic and white onion. Said that backwards. This time I don't mind getting there with my hands because the worst part of this is already come and gone, right? We've already put the egg in, the, the slimy parts. So at this point now, we just want to get all of this goodness in here as good as we can. Let's open here. Always take your blade out, folks, where you go putting your fingers in your food processor. Because otherwise, you're going to be in some pain. I'm sort of prepared here, but not quite, because we got to get our cheese, too, and I haven't opened them yet. So we're going to... Oh, I'm making a mess today. Yikes. So, I just want to mix the onion in as good as possible and the garlic. Get it in there good as you can folks try not to leave any untouched areas as far as it goes although it's mainly just for flavor ones that actually that you use on pizza except for this one all right taste that is just so 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 good this is not basic meatloaf folks do not try this at home if you don't know how to cook and use flavors this is advanced meatloaf <laughs> and we haven't even started putting in the seasons yet this is just like the good part we ain't even we ain't even really got this thing going yet okay all right that should be enough of that Okay, now, before we even get the cheeses in, let's go ahead and put in the seasonings, all right? So we're gonna put in black pepper. We're gonna put in my thing y'all know I love, fire smoke, the usual all-purpose seasoning. Be generous with it, honey. You want to season this thing? Get it seasoned. Nobody likes bland meatloaf. No one, nowhere. Get a lot of that in there. Okay. <clears throat> Next step. Believe it or not, Jack Daniel's chicken rub. Again, believe it or not, Jack Daniel's chicken rub. How you feel like? Really? Yeah, really. It gives this flavor that y'all not gonna believe. This is Italian style, but it's not gonna be just totally Italian taste. Your Merlot salt. You know, like Merlot the wine, this salt is made with those Merlot grapes also, which is why it has this beautiful pinkish color to it. Ugh, repeat that. Sometimes I just go ahead and pop this thing off, but my fingernail is not going to let me do that today. Nothing is, it don't want to come off, guys. There we go. Be very careful using sharp objects. What I did is not something you should do if you're not sure how to handle stuff without hurting yourself. All right, put the top back on that. My two favorite things in the world right now. Some smoked paprika. Get that in there. And we're also going to get in, what? What? Say it for me. Old Bay. Last thing we're gonna do now, we're gonna add these cheeses, and then we're gonna get to mixing this up for our final mix run here before it's ready to go into the oven. Cheese, cheese, cheese. Gotta have it. This, today's dinner gonna be good, y'all. I mean, this is gonna be so good. We're gonna use one bag of that there, all right? Now we're gonna start mixing stuff up again. 
mixing, mixing, mixing. Okay. The Merlot salt gives this very poignant smell to things and flavor. I love it. I'm so happy I discovered it. This smells so good. And also that smoked paprika, yum. The smell is just like divine. All right, the smell is amazing. All right, so now we got this pretty well mixed, right? So now we're gonna start forming the loaf. <clears throat> Meat loaves are not perfect, but you do want to try to get it into as much of a loaf shape as you can here. Pack it as tight as you can. Now, here's where the fun comes in in my meatloaf. Because now I'm going to use my hand and create another pocket. See that? We're going to flip this back a little bit. Because you know what's got to go in here, don't you? I'll tell you what's got to go in there. Cheese. More cheese is going on the inside. <clears throat> Get that as flat as you can there. I don't know what Amazon is telling me is coming today. Because to my knowledge, no one's ordered things. That's a little weird. But alas, we're getting a message. Weird. I don't know. I have no idea why it's happening. I think I'm going to say this one. Eh, we'll use it. <laughs> Alright. Get this as far back as you can. If you're using a lot of cheese and if you got a big loaf like me. Get you a nice little ledge, as I like to call it. Alright. Take this. Right? And just start stuffing it in there. Stuff that stuff in there. Stuff, 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 stuff. <clears throat> because cheese expands, you could have even wrapped your meatloaf in foil first. Sometimes I do that so that it keeps the cheese in as it cooks. But today, if we lose some cheese, I ain't that worried about it. But you can do it that way, too, just to make sure that you don't lose any. Use some of this cheese for tomorrow for breakfast. All right. So now, we're going to try to close this thing up. You might have to do some more reshaping because it's splitting apart here on the sides. Again, another reason why I like using better quality meat, actually. Um, when I was in Maryland... I got a different type of meat from the store, not this big roll meat, and it held its shape much better than this is doing, but you know, we're doing what we can on a budget today. And it's still gonna be good, and that's what matters. Is it gonna be good? Yeah, it's gonna be good. Pack it, get it nice and solid. Shape it the best you can. Look at that. Let me clean my hands real quick. I'm gonna come back and show you that. Okay. All right. So let's lower you down here so you can really see what's good, what's going on before I wrap this up in foil. Look at that. Look at it. That's a meatloaf, folks. That is meatloaf. Meatloaf, that big, that gorgeous. Yes, yes, meatloaf. <clears throat> so now what I'm gonna do, let me give it one more pat though, because I see some cracks. And I don't want nothing falling apart. What we're gonna do now is we're just gonna wrap this up in some foil and we're gonna get it in the oven. I'm going to cook it on 350 for as long as it takes. Um, I like to check mine as I'm going. First, I'm going to wrap it up solid, solid, so there's nothing escaping. 
I'm going to come back and check on it after a loosened hour with a meatloaf fish. But normally meatloaf doesn't take that long to cook, guys. So when you're making a meatloaf this size, it is going to take long, okay? So you're going to have to make sure you cook it long enough so you don't make nobody sick. Although, newsflash, I want to go over this with y'all. First of all, beef well done is car carcinogenic, carcinogenic, meaning it causes cancer. Meat that is beef, red meats should only be cooked to medium rare or rare to keep you healthy. And I know, especially among the black community, we were taught if it looks pink, it's not done and make you sick. That's a lie. That's not true. It's quite the opposite. And it's also more tender and more flavorful. The more undone you leave it without it being raw, the inner temperature is important and the inner temperature should at least be to 135 to 140 to not make someone sick on a beef product. Although you can also eat it raw like a beef tartare because beef rarely makes people sick with parasites like pork or chicken or turkey does. You can eat most tunas raw, you can eat uh, sushi grade salmon raw, and you can, believe it or not, eat beef raw. Yep, news fact, although we've been taught to hate it and taught to think it's bad, bad, bad. Beef tartare is raw and it's one of my favorite things in the world to eat and I've never gotten sick once from it. All right, so I'm gonna get this in the oven for a while and I'll be back in a bit. Time for the store run. So, hey guys, in the interest of safety, earlier when I was explaining to you what temperatures your beef should be at, when you're using ground beef like meatloaf, you actually have to get the internal temperature to 160. I remember that when I came back from the store because I was like, oh, I'm giving them the wrong instructions. Let me hold this up. I'm tired of bending. So, if you are making something that is, for instance, like a steak, then you're fine at what I said earlier. But if you're making anything that's ground, a sausage, a ground beef, whatever it is, it has to be at at least 160 internally for safety. All right, remember that. All right, and in just a second, after I enjoy my cold Sunday beer, and I probably am gonna put my hair back now because it's getting on my nerves, what we're gonna do at that point is get into starting the mac and cheese. The rice pudding will be last because it's the easiest thing to do. And I always like to make my family wait at least an hour to two hours after they eat dinner before they get dessert anyway. So that's perfect. All right, be back soon. All right. So what I'm about to do now, and what you see on my board is flour. What I'm about to do now is, it's not a board, it's my baking sheet, sorry. We're going to bake the bacon so it gets to the perfect Christmas crispness for what we're using. Um, so we're going to use as much as we can because it's going to end up getting broken down in the food processor. I need another bag. Hold on one second, folks. I need a house with a new and more powerful and big stove. When I was in Maryland, everything took so much faster than the stove I have here at the house. Cause I'm still waiting on this water to boil to get my mac and cheese going. And it's irritating me to no end. Y'all just have no idea how bad the irritation level is right now. Cause that is holding dinner up. So to make the mac and cheese, um, of course I'll be making a roux. A roux is just a thickening agent that stretches and makes the cheese uh, thicker and creamier. And the way I make my roux, of course, is with water. I've explained this a few times. Water, butter, and uh, you can use flour or you can use cornstarch. I'll be using flour today. And you add it while, well, actually, the water needs to boil on the stove first. So let me do, say that first. Because you can't make a roux unless something is boiling because it won't thicken unless it's at a boil. So actually, you are boiling your water first with a little bit of oil and salt in it. And then you are adding your thickening agent, okay? If that makes sense to you, and hopefully it does. And you're just going to use your whisk then and whisk it till it's a creamy enough thickness. You don't want to get it too thick because remember, you're also adding your melted down cheeses. And the best way to melt your cheese is to put it in a bowl above 
a pot of water that's boiling. You don't want to put your cheese directly in your pot because it'll stick and be a mess. You need to do it over top. The same way you make your own hollandaise sauce, if you choose to make your own hollandaise sauce. I prefer to buy hollandaise sauce. I'm not about that life of making it. Hold on one second. I need to grab my apron so I have something to wipe my hands on. As we go. Alright, so what we're doing now, you see I've got the bacon. I like to season my bacon. I like to use a little salt and some pepper. So let me tie this good back here behind my back. Alright, so we're going to use, I'm going to put some pepper on here. Now, I'm going to set this directly on the bottom of my oven. That sounds crazy, right? But that's what's about to happen. The pan should be able to withstand it. Um, if it's not, <laughs> then I'll be crying and be like, oh, no, I burnt my pan. So let's hope that doesn't happen. Just season a little bit with a little of the Merlot salt. I'm going to do two layers here. I'm going to do this first batch first, take them out, and then we'll go with the second batch. But we're going to get this first batch and it shouldn't take long because the oven's been on a little while. It should already be pretty warm. But in this mac and cheese, here are some of the other ingredients you're going to need. You are going to need this queso fresco cheese, fresh. You're going to need your cultured whole buttermilk. You're going to need some mozzarella, some queso, quesadilla cheese, and some pepper jack. Now, this is like an Alfredo mac and cheese as I describe it, right? So, we also have jars of Alfredo, but actually, this is more like the mixture you use when you're making rasta pasta. But rasta pasta actually tastes like an Alfredo just with more flavor because of the different types of cheeses you are using. <clears throat> so this is basically what's going to go in it and then to top it you're going to grind these up in your food processor to make breadcrumbs the cheese it duos with the bacon cheddar all right so i'm just showing you this so that you understand the ingredients that are all going in the mac and cheese i'll be back in a bit Okay, so starting over because a few minutes ago me and my daughter talked over my recording and also my phone went dead. All right, so I have the bacon and cheddar Cheez-Its in here, all except for what was left in the bag, which I decided to start snacking on. They're really good. So now they're behind me on the shelf here. And um, <clears throat> I did let my daughter taste some and I gave my significant other like three of them to taste. He just wanted to taste them. They were good, but the rest of them are in here with me. But enough small talk about that. Oh, and I usually show y'all what I'm drinking on. This is today's beer. I had a Modella earlier, but this is what we're moving on to. So we're now just going to took out the first batch of bacon. It's cool over there cooling because you want it to cool so it gets really hard and really crispy. Um, because that's going to end up going in the food processor too once both batches are done. 
Then we're going to add the tomato slices and other toppings to the top of the meatloaf because it should be about that time now. And I took the temperature down from, I don't know why my stove is leaking. I took the temperature down from 425 to 350 now, also in the oven on anything that's in there because the oven has enough heat now. So right now we're just going to grind up our crackers. And just like that, you have your topping, your breadcrumbs with the matching flavors for what you're making. Just like that, food processor does just about anything. So <clears throat> we're gonna need to transfer these though because we will need to put other things in there. So we're gonna put this in one of my clean casserole containers here. Dump this in here because the next thing we gotta food process, like I mentioned, is the bacon. So we need to make some room for the bacon. All right. And when you're going to use your bacon here, you actually can just leave it like it is because all this is going into the same dish. So it doesn't matter if there's a little residual breadcrumb in there. It's not going to hurt your dish. But normally, yes, you would clean it in between. All right. So we got all our breadcrumbs that we're going to be using in here. Well, our breadcrumbs made from crackers. We'll cover that up. Throw this stuff away. And now we're just going to wait for our bacon to cool off enough and for the other batch to get done. But in the meantime, what we're about to do, now my phone is charging, so I'm going to have to keep also grabbing the charger while we're doing this. <clears throat> so we're going to grab the charger and we're going to move right into the kitchen. All right. So we're in the kitchen. I'll plug this in. Bear with me here. Because now what we're about to do is we are about to get ready to do that thing I told you with the cheese. I'll move this back a little so hopefully you can see everything. The greens are still going. I'm going to turn them back up a little bit. They were going too much there. I had to turn them down. Um, the water was already boiling, so now we got to do is put our mold in. All right. Because we've already removed the pasta, the bones in. that we're going to use in this mixture. <clears throat> some cheese and some cheese products because we all know Velveeta is not necessarily really a cheese. For this, I got the queso blanco because we are making white. If you'll notice, I also use the queso blanco back around Christmas time when I made a squash vegetarian lasagna and I wanted something extra in there to make it super cheesy. Okay. So, first thing we're going to do is get all these cheeses in here. The next thing we're going to do after that is work on our roux. <clears throat> in all honesty, I might just add the roux to the cheese just to make this easier. Well, no, I won't be able to do that because we need it to boil. I always forget that part. So, just start plopping this cheese. This is the crumbly Mexican cheese. Really, really good stuff. <clears throat> this is fresh from the deli at the market, and then they packaged it. Really, really, really good stuff. I'm going to have to clean up because I'm making a mess. If we had mice right now with all the cheese that's falling to the floor, they'd be quite happy. As you're cutting, make sure you're not getting any plastic in there. I'm glad I saw that. This, to me, is almost like a Mexican version of mozzarella, if you will. It's it's just a really rich, nice cheese. All right. So that's probably enough of this type of cheese. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to get a bag to put this in. 
because we're going to want to save this to use for something else later in the week. Waste not, want not, I always say. Get my cheese bag started there. Makes such a mess. Ugh. Cooking some messy thing. Put that in the trash. All right. So while that one's going, I also like to add a little milk here at this point because otherwise that cheese might start sticking to the bottom of the bowl. So you want to have some liquid in there. Add a little of your butter cream in there. Buttermilk rather. And if you want to see the type I'm using, it's thick. Cultured whole buttermilk, all right? Cultured whole buttermilk is what we're using there. Put that back in the fridge. Now we're going to move on to adding the Velveeta product. I wish they'd make the Velveeta box cover easier to get off. I hate it. Every single time I cook, I hate it. So... I'm going to open this up now. <clears throat> Be careful with your sharp objects. Cutting myself enough has caught me, so now I'm pretty good here at what I do. Keep your flammables away from your burners, like I just had to do there. All right. So honestly, we're going to use about... Eh, about half of this block. I just use my hand and twist it right on in there. All right. So we got about, we'll take a little more than half, put it in there. All right. Wash my hands real quick. Then we'll add everything else that needs to go in. All right. Now, at the end of this, your bacon. When it's as crisp as also going to go in here. So that you can stir all of this stuff evenly throughout your macaroni mixture. Because you want it to be even. Just that. Okay. Next, we're going to get in our other stuff, guys. All right. We're going to get in some of that taste of quesadilla cheese. Ooh, make it a mess. Should be enough of that. And fold the rest down. Put it in our cheese bag. Cheese bag is going in the fridge. Because that cheese bag is going to help us make some great stuff the rest of the week for breakfast. Now the mozzarella. Alright, just like that. Get that mozzarella off your stove before it melts to it. <laughs> mozzarella melts. Come quick. As I'm sure you already know. That's why it's the perfect cheese for pizza and lots of other things. I use it to give my mac and cheese that cheese pull we're all looking for. And now the pepper jack. All right. That's the last cheese that's going in. I'm going to wash my hands real quick. Get all this cheese off. Also, I'm going to open the oven real quick, see how that bacon's coming along. Turn the temperature down so it's going to cook a little slower than the last batch did. But I had to do that because my meatloaf is also in there. And I do not want to overdry my meatloaf. So we're going to put the cheese back up. Okay. And at this point, we are going to get a nice wooden spoon here. And we're just going to start to move all this around. I put my cuisinot cooking glove on so I don't burn myself. You just want to start moving everything around. You might find that you need a little more milk. At this point, we're just in whole milk dough, not the buttermilk. The buttermilk's too thick. Just the milk. Maybe just a little more. I'd say if you're going to use milk, no more than half cup. Should be necessary because you already put in the buttermilk. I'm going to put the mitt back on. I'm going to raise this up just so you can see in there. And then I'm going to go back to stirring this. And I'm going to need both hands for that. So I'll be back in a bit. 
Hey everyone, so it's important to let you know this. Once you've got your cheese melted, especially if it contains mozzarella, you still need to keep the heat on and you need to keep it covered in a dome of some type. Because if not, it'll start to harden and it'll get that real elasticity that mozzarella get. So it's done, but I have a lid on it and I've got it on a setting of two on the gas stove. Greens are still going. We're just about ready to take out the last batch of, um, I'm sorry, last batch of bacon. I've got the broiler on. And actually, we're about to take that out right now. <clears throat> and um, after that, what we're going to do is we're going to grind this bacon up in a food processor. So we're going to pull this off first. And then we're going to take it over to the sink. Get rid of that oil. I have a pan in there. We're not pouring oil directly into our drain. Normally what I do with my oil is I keep it and I put it in my deep fryer. But I don't have that luxury that we're not doing that today. Because I am not going to take the time to try to get that sucker open and all that right now. Time is of the essence. Alright. So I just want to grab this. Like we did before, we're going to sit them on here so they can cool off. Then we're going to let my bacon pan cool off because it's not necessarily meant to hold up to what I've got, the work I've got it doing today. So we're just putting all this over here. Bacon, it keeps it from shrinking up into those little hard pieces that we're used to. So it's up here so it can cool. I've got my window open a little bit. Then what we're going to do is we're going to turn that broiler off as we need to because we now need to give our meatloaf some attention. So first let me close it so I can get up to it. We're gonna put it on bake. Well first we gotta stop the broil I guess. Stop, bake. We're gonna turn this back down to about 200 at this point. We don't even need it at 250, 200 because this has been cooking for a while, okay? Make sure you push start once you change functions. I'm going to pull it back out now. Yeah, I know. I changed the function of my stove. It's hollering at me like someone did something. Yes, I know. I did it. All right. And start pulling your foil back. Be careful. The steam is going to be hot. Right. I'm going to take your top off here. Some of it's stuck. Don't worry about it. You still got no meat loaf here to work with. Let me make this so you can see it as we get ready to work with it. All right, so we brought you down to my level, right? There's the meatloaf. So now we're going to do some of the more traditional things to our meatloaf. Some traditional, some not so traditional. So, what we're about to do first is make some nice tomato slices. Sorry, I'm stepping in front of the camera for a few moments here. <clears throat> We're going to make some nice tomato slices real quick. We're going to cut those up. All right. We're also going to open up some pesto. This is going to be so good, y'all. This is going to be like one of the, this is life-changing meatloaf right here. I sold it while I was in Maryland, made it a little differently, but for the most part, this is the exact same recipe, all right? Get your tomato slices on, press them down if you need to. Make sure they stay put. See, we got some sliders. You might have more tomato than you need it. That's all right. Double stack it. Get the tomatoes on. They're really good, and they're going to cook down. Y'all know tomatoes cook down. Y'all know it like I know it. So double laying them definitely doesn't hurt anything. All right, let me wipe off my mess I made over here. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to go get that pesto real quick. Got the first jar open earlier today, easy peasy. Now my hands. Um, I'm developing arthritis in one of my thumbs, so it makes some of my tasks a little harder than they used to be, so bear with me. Got it. Because I was going to say, otherwise, y'all about to have to watch me run off to my boyfriend and ask for some help. <laughs> All right. So, 
put it on there with a spoon. Normally I just pour it on, but I'm trying not to make as much of a mess. We want to make sure that the flavor stays where we're getting them crevices if you need to. Be generous with your pesto, honey. Don't be shy. I don't know why when I cook I go into a more southern accent, y'all. That's not how I normally talk. It's hilarious to me that I do that. Maybe in my mind I think it sounds more like hospitality-like. I don't know. But get your pesto on there. Be generous with it. This, this flavor is very, very important for this dish. Use every last bit of it. Okay? Got that on there. Now, the part we're all used to, right? Your ketchup. The ketchup is not the main thing on mine. It is a layer of flavor, but it is not the main flavor. Got it? So get your ketchup on. Get that on, folks. Get your ketchup on. All right. Got the ketchup on. Start throwing away some stuff, too, while we're doing that. All right. The most important part of mine is this sauce that I made earlier. Let it boil over for a sec. Set it right there. <clears throat> I'm going to get at this point my most generous ladle. All right, save some because you want to, when you're plating, pour this over people's plates too. You make it really pretty in presentation. Get it on there. Like I said, save some now for plating. Don't be scared. Put as much sauce in here as you want. Ain't nobody gonna be mad at you. See that? I'm gonna put the top back on this. <clears throat> We're gonna move our foil for a bit because we want this to brown a little cat a little bit this time. <clears throat> now we're gonna push it back in the oven and we're gonna let it do what it do. Just like that. The last thing you're gonna add to it is cheese, but you're not gonna do that yet because you don't want your cheese to burn. Start. And we're going to let that do what it does. And I will be back with you guys in a bit. I'm about to mix the mac and cheese. I actually moved y'all too soon. You know how they say too soon? Yep, too soon. We got our butter mountain, right? So now I need just a little bowl. We need a bowl and we need some water because we're about to make the thickening agent. We're about to make a roux here. All right. Because we want our cheese to be really, really good and to out the dish. We don't want to miss nothing or mess nothing, right? You're going to put, got your butter heating up in your pan already. Or you can use oil. I prefer butter. Use about, depending on how much mac and cheese you got. I'm using a lot. There I probably use about a cup of flour. You may or may not need that much depending on what you are making. All right, while your butter's melting in the pan, you're just going to get your whisker and you're going to start whisking, whisking, whisking away. I've showed y'all this enough times now that y'all should have this down pat. We're going to need more water because of how much flour I put. Start stirring. You have to judge once you start stirring what you actually need because you want it to have a loose, silky consistency. You do not want clumpy. You may not even use all of this. You put some in here, you'll gauge how thick it is, and then you'll decide how much you need because the cheese itself is thick. Give a nice whisk without making too big of a mess. I like to go back and forth. I showed y'all this before in one of my other videos. I do what everyone else does, but I also go back and forth, straight to the bottom, kind of hard to make sure you're getting as much of it as you can. So... We're just going to let that sit until we're ready to use it. We've got it all whisked up, though, and ready to go. Keep your whisk close by because you are about to need it. Because as you pour, you're going to whisk. That's how you make a roux. So I'll be back in a bit. See, this is why I put the apron on because flour and stuff, it's a mess. So I'll be back in a bit to mix the mac and cheese. But I just want to show you all the components. You want your oil or your butter. You want your pan to get nice and hot. I'm going to bring this up to a higher heat. You want to add. You want to stir as you whisk so you can see how thick it's getting as you go. 
and you want to have your macaroni and cheese ready to go so i'm going to put that in the pans as we go so let's take a walk walking 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 all right so we're here all right i contemplate i'm gonna need two pans when they're smaller i usually do all right so we're gonna go get our pasta that had to go cool it off works too. When you need shit to go smooth, it never does. Get that in there. I missed a lot. Didn't I? Luckily for us, surface is perfectly clean. You can do that, guys, if your surface is clean. Now, if you've been half-assing on sanitizing and cleaning, you cannot do that. Know who you are and deal with your process accordingly. Thank goodness for me, I clean as I go. So if something falls on the counter, we don't have to throw it away. Unless it now falls on the floor, folks, I don't care how clean the floor is. You got to throw that away. All right? So we're going to take a little over here because I want these even. I try to make everything even. Maybe it's my Aries brain. I don't know. But, yeah, that's how I am. It has to be even. All right. So the first thing we're going to put in is these jars of Alfredo. This is roasted garlic Alfredo. I normally make my Alfredo completely come scratch. And it's still going to have that from scratch component because y'all saw what I did with them cheeses over there. So don't worry. This is not going to taste like it came from a jar in any sense of the word. Not going to be possible. So we're going to put those in those first. All right. We got that first. Next thing we're going to do. Carefully without spilling it all over your floor. You go grab your roux. 
walk it over. Half in one, half in the other. Get all of that. We got a few lumps, it's okay. But like I said earlier, try not to have too many lumps. Okay, I'm making a mess today. All right. Here's where the real mess is about to happen. <laughs> Pouring this cheese into these containers is never fun, but it is necessary. You can't have mac and cheese without cheese. That would be ridiculous, right? So you gonna grab that, grab your spoon again. Try not to burn yourself. I'm gonna move this further back because it's really in my way. All right, we're gonna sit this one here. And we're going to begin our pour. That's one, two, and I don't know what we're doing with this extra cheese because we sure got plenty of it. All right. So for now, though, we're going to set this out of the way somewhere. And look at all that cheese. And now we're going to start to stir it. Take the glove off so you can get a good secure feel on your pan. You want to mix everything up evenly throughout. Look, I will make you change how you feel about gross white macaroni cheese. I hate it too, for the record, but this is good. <clears throat> and I was like, macaroni cheese shouldn't be white. Normally, no, it shouldn't. But when you're making different things, it's good to have an itinerary, you know, of different things you can make. <clears throat> the mess that is happening today, though. Can we just talk about the mess, the mess level? So we're just stirring this up, stirring this up, stirring this up. All right? You want to make sure, again, like I said, you get things evenly throughout. Evenly, folks. Evenly being the most important term we use today. Make sure you got things mixed in real good. All right? Now, while that's sitting for a second, guys, I'm going to go grab this other bacon as well as move some things back to where they belong instead of on my workstation. y'all closer in so you can see what's about to go down so we are about to put these other pieces in you want to grind them up as tiny as you can all right now what i find, like i like to do you know your food processor is going to be relatively full you do a little bit and then you add more all right so at this point on high, grind up the first bits of bacon. See, now we got enough space to put something else in. Take your top, sit it in the same place real quick. Put the rest of your bacon in. <clears throat> and again, this is kind of the same thing. You got to make sure you get equal amounts of bacon in both pans. You don't want one pan to be better than the other pan. Okay, so in we go, in we go, in we go. Got a paper towel because my hands are greasy and gross and I don't like it. All right, so here we go again. Top on, closing, top. pieces as small as you can. All right. Bacon ready to go. Bring your blade, get all of it off of it. Sit your blade down. Moving you with me again. It's cool, right? We just keep moving with each other. Ah. So now, one thing I did forget, we want a second spoon. Not the same spoon we had. Mm. 
Mm. All right. So, we're going to take half. Food processor almost directly divided it for us. You just get one half from around the circle and the next half from around the other circle. Get that? You can also do this with bacon bits, but I wanted a really, really fresh, strong taste of bacon in mine. Bacon bits are okay, but trust me, this will give you better flavor, in my opinion. All right? Now we're going to do that even distribution again. And when I look at it, I feel like this one has one more spoonful than that one. Yeah, I'm that ain't only time. So, <laughs> go figure. But that's a good way to be when you're cooking for folks. you got to be that kind of anal retentive because you want a bite of this in every bit of the mixture. Look at how evenly that's mixing. You wouldn't have thought that was going to happen, right? You'd be like, that's not enough bacon. But it is. It's more or less a flavor thing. Anyway, this bacon at this point. So, you should be able to see it throughout. So, that's the first one all mixed up. We're going to do the same thing over here. I don't know why I feel like this pan over here is going to be the better pan when it comes out. Because it just seems thicker. I think the cheese was thicker that poured into this one. Sometimes that happens. You don't want it to, but it does. All right. Keep mixing. Make sure you get every corner. You want every corner to have some bacon in it. All right. Got that going. Got that going. <clears throat> All right. Pat it smooth. Now, for the fun part, the really, really fun part, our topping made from those bacon and cheddar flavored cheeses. Yum. It's going to be so good, y'all. Oh, y'all don't understand how good this is going to be. Y'all like, yeah, we do. It looks good. Nah, you got to taste it, though. Should I add this to my repertoire? Should it be one of my main menu items? What do y'all think? <laughs> We're working on my new menus and flyers as we speak for my Baltimore trip. Remember, the Baltimore trip is in April, to be precise. It is April 19th through the 23rd. Just so y'all know. So if you're in the Baltimore area and you want to taste some of Sauce's Best Catering's good food, this is your opportunity to do so. All right. And so we're going to put these in the oven. And that's that. All right, my loves. We're back. So we are about to make our bread pudding. So I have some whole thick milk. I'm using a wok. I know it's weird, right? But all my other pans are busy. And you normally cook rice in a wok, right? So why the hell not? That's what we're doing today. All right. There's some butter. <clears throat> I know y'all seen those cooking show competitions where they're making and cooking all kinds of stuff. So this shouldn't be that weird to you, all right? So <clears throat> some of the things we're going to need. Vanilla extract. Cinnamon sugar. Pure ground cinnamon. One moment. Nutmeg. And this is not something you have to do, but this is something I do. I use a little unflavored gelatin. Very, very, very little. Very little. And we'll add it once it starts to boil. We are not going to use much of it at all. Okay? And we're going to use dried cranberries instead of raisins because my family absolutely, positively hates raisins. So we're not doing that. All right? So think of it as like you're flavoring like cereal milk almost. You can add your ingredients after. I like to add mine before I add the rice. <clears throat> So 
So I like to use one fourth of a cup of vanilla extract. Everybody uses a different amount. Of oh, and the other main ingredient, of course, sugar. Um, you can use brown sugar or white sugar. I normally use brown sugar, but today I'm using white because I was crazy at the grocery store today and grabbed that. I don't know why I did that. I normally always mix things like yams and stuff with brown, brown sugar. But today, my crazy tail grabbed regular white sugar. So, but you know, it'll work. But brown sugar is actually better, all right? So if you're at the store, get brown sugar instead of what I did, all right? You don't want to go too heavy on nutmeg. That should be plenty. I'd say that's about two and a half tablespoons full. You can be as generous as you want with your sugar now, you know, according to your family's taste. My family likes sweet. Oh, and there's one whole stick of butter in there. As far as the milk, I think I already threw it away, didn't I? Uh, here we go. As far as the milk, I used the remainder of this. Now, I'd already used someone says one quart. I'd say I used three-fourths of the quart in there. Because I used some of it when we were making our cheese mixture for our mac and cheese. So that, I just put about five tablespoons full of cinnamon sugar in, all right? With the ground real cinnamon, we don't need that much. <clears throat> We're just going to use very little of this because too much cinnamon and too much nutmeg is extremely, extremely, extremely overpowering. So for this, I am going to grab a spoon. Some fell. You saw it happen. One. And then just a half because you've already got the cinnamon sugar, so you don't need too much of that. Okay. <clears throat> Going to use our regular sugar also here. I might end up even having to add a little water to this. I'm not there yet, but it might happen. Depending on how much rice I decide to use. Because we want this sweet honey, we're initially going to go for the full cup of sugar. Alright? And we decide we need more, you add more. But you shouldn't need more. But I know some people really do like stuff like super, super, super sweet. But the cranberry should give it some sweetness too. So you got to remember that. Alright? I like to use the whisker instead of a regular spoon while we're trying to get this going. Now just get everything in there. You lose some cinnamon on the side. Try to get it all in there. Doesn't it look like cinnamon toast crunch almost? The color it does, right? Also, I'm doing is checking the meatloaf. I <laughs> think I'm going to take that meatloaf out in about 20 minutes because we need to get the mac and cheese in. All right. Just trying to get this all melted. It's on high. It might take a while there. While we're doing that, it's a, you can be multitasking, be checking on stuff, you know? I don't put the gelatin until the rice has cooked, by the way, if you're wondering why that didn't go in yet. We're not adding that yet. So checking on my greens. want to see how they're doing. We're looking good. We're looking good. So I can turn that heat down now to just two. It was on four. Well, we're not going to sit here and watch this pot try to boil. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add my rice. I'm going to constantly be coming back, stirring it so it doesn't scorch or burn to the bottom. And once the rice is at the consistency I think it should be, that's when we're going to begin to add the dried cranberries and the gelatin. So, um, yeah, I'm going to add just enough rice to feel like there's a submerged. So it's almost going to be like an even amount of rice and an even amount of liquid at the beginning. But you can find any rice pudding recipe that you like online if you don't like mine. But this is how we're doing this. Um, and it's sweet. I like that. I like where we're at right now. It tastes perfect. So all we're going to do now is wait just a little, little, little bit. And we're going to get some rice in there. So I'll come back probably just to show you the finished version of rice pudding. Because it's really such a simple recipe to make that you shouldn't need a lot of instruction for it. All right? See you soon. 
Okay, so I just want to show you this because now I've got everything in the pan. You can see it's starting to boil. This is a dessert similar to risotto. How you make risotto that you have to babysit. So yes, I am babysitting the hell out of this because uh, you do not want it to scorch to the bottom. Matter of fact, you should already be ready with a cup of extra water just in case and it should be close by. So I've got my water ready to go if we need it. And we're just going to keep stirring and stirring. You can see all the dry cranberries in there along with all the sugar, a little bit of the gelatin. You do not have to do that. I just like how I'm thick, but you don't have to do that. Um, and you can feel it getting a little thick to stir. So when that happens, yeah, you can go ahead and add some more water. One cup. Because you definitely don't want the gelatin to be too thick. It's not supposed to be jelly. It's supposed to be pudding. Alright. You want to keep this thing moving now. Keep your spoon moving. Put some more, get some more water close by. So that if an emergency begins to happen and something starts, wow, I just made a mess with water. And something starts sticking to the bottom of the stove, you are already ready to go. I'm using a, I'm, Imusa, I M U S A wok. Uh, that larger pan you also saw me making the tomato sauce and was also a pan by that company. I love them. They have really good products for Asian and Caribbean style cooking and Latin style cooking. So they're who I go to when I need something like that. We are just about ready to take this meatloaf up out of here. <clears throat> so I'm going to walk away for a quick moment, but still paying attention. Because that is a meal you gotta pay attention to. Put that there. We're clearing off the space to move this meat right to. Right back in. Ready to stir. Again, because you know what gets real hot right in that center area. So you gotta keep stirring it. You don't want no problems, you know. Sometimes when I don't like how my wok is cooking something though, I will switch over to something else and I'm already eyeing pots in case I need to do that. Because you know what? In an actuality, I think that is what I want to do. I think I want to switch over to what is normally my steaming pot. Just because I feel like it's easier to control. Now I'm going to turn the burner off because we do want to maintain the heat we had already built up on the burner. Let me grab my mitt so I don't burn myself here. I'm trying to make this transfer. Alright. Sometimes you just got to improvise, folks. Sometimes things start going a little different to plan and that's okay. Just move your mixture. No biggie. Move it. It smells so good. It's going to be so good. I know it. It smells like heaven. Great ball, you're right. So don't leave none of that behind. Any cranberries, get everything in there. Put this aside so I can wash it in a few minutes. <laughs> okay. And in this, you actually can add a little more water. Now, I'm going to let you know. Straight up. You are still going to need to wash it heavily. Because, especially in this kind of band, pan, it can really, really, really stick to the bottom since this pan is not necessarily meant for its present usage. You want to keep stirring it, stirring it, stirring it. All right. Now, what you can do, though, to make this cook faster, as you stand here, you cannot leave it. You cannot ignore it. You cannot walk away from other things is put a top back on it. Because the rice cooks better with a lid. You have to watch it. And when you put this top on, I like to turn mine down to three or four then. Because we're just going to cook it slower. And you know, fuck. Okay. That was a blooper. Y'all were not supposed to see. I forgot that thing had water in it. So I just put out my flames. Don't you love it? So we are going to carefully remove our grid. The grid is hot. It's not meant for that much, I'm afraid. And we're going to carefully get this water up. So I'm going to stop now and I'll come back in a second. And we'll All right, so just like that, we're back. Problem cleaned up and solved. I need to mop my floor, but overall, the problem has been solved. Gotta love that kind of stuff happens, don't you? Just like it happens to everybody, though. 
There's not a chef around who hasn't had some type of accident in the kitchen that they'd rather not have y'all know about, but it happens. You can add star anise to your uh, bread pudding, I mean not bread pudding, see, rice pudding also. If you have some, I do, but I don't want the licorice taste to it. All right, so what we're about to do now, one last step to this meatloaf, we're gonna melt some cheese on it. <clears throat> you cannot do steps like this that take this long to regular meatloaf. I need to keep pointing that out. This thing is super sized, and that's why I'm getting away with this. But if you try to do what I'm doing to a regular standard size meatloaf, it would be dry, and no one would want it. So, only do these steps, or take the same amount of time as me, if you know that you are making a really standard size meatloaf. Alright? This meatloaf heavy, honey. This is a baby. That thing's heavy enough to be a whole kid. So, once that cheese is melted, though, it is done, done. And we will take it out, and we will cover it back in foil so it doesn't dry out until we're ready to eat. All right? So, I'll be back in a bit. I just want you to see the meatloaf now that I took it out of the oven. Look at that. I had to show it to you before I cover it in foil. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is that, right? We're going to garnish it just a little too. Make sure it's pretty. I mean, I mean, it don't get no better than this. This is not your grandma's meatloaf. This is like some gourmet, take that family dining idea out of it. Look at how beautiful that is. I mean, it's divine. And I'm going to wrap it up until we're ready for dinner. Because I still get ready to put in the mac and cheese now and I'm still stirring rice pudding. But... Definitely wanted y'all to see that. Let me get above so y'all can really see it. Look at that. Meatloaf. Gorgeous. Be back in a bit. All right, guys. So while we are waiting still for this bread pudding to get done so I can move it into its container so it can start its cooling process. Although, honestly, I might cover mine and bake mine a little bit. Different people do it different ways. And no one way is right or wrong. It's time to slice up a little of this fresh bread to get ready to toast to go to dinner. I did not feel like making bread today, but y'all have seen me make bread, so you know I can't. <laughs> Just not doing that today. All right. I think I've done enough today. And like I told y'all, you got to keep stirring this right so it does not scorch and stick to the bottom. So I just came over there and gave it a stir. I'm going to turn it down a little bit now, actually. It was boiling so slow that we weren't getting anywhere, but now I think we're good. All right? So I've got a tin pan. Let's sit that gently on top of the meatloaf. And we're just going to slice up some crostinis. <clears throat> just to give people a little bread, a little crunch on their plate. My doggy is tripping again today, guys. Always, always, always. So we're just going to put these in here, like so. I do not like this pan. Hold on, I'm not sure what's going on with it. Hold on, watch it. So, that's supposed to be a clean pan, but it was not looking so clean to me. It's new, too. I don't, and that was packaged. I don't know what's going on there. So, we're going to go ahead and put these in here. They're not the biggest pieces of bread you'll ever feed your guests with, but they're cute. You know? They're cute. Sometimes that's what we want. As far as my dog, he wants to come in, and he is not coming in my house because it is beautiful outside. He has a dog house. He's good to go. I say this every time. Y'all should be used to me saying it now. By the way, I know it seems like he's never in the house, but he actually is. But he's in here when it's like cold and has to come in. Other than that, though, he prefers outside. It's just that when he hears my voice or smells food, he wants to come in here. But I don't play that game with him because I'm not about to keep going in and out trying to make him happy. To season my crostinis, just a little bit of that everything seasoning. Hard to get it stick to the oil sometimes, but there we go. And when they come out, you'll put it on with just a little parsley. Now we're just gonna leave these here for a little bit. 
So that macaroni cheese is about halfway done. Then we're going to put it in there. I'm going to sit it here actually on top of the meatloaf where I know it won't fall. I just don't trust them on the edges. So I'm going to go back now and finish stirring this rice pudding. I'll be back in a bit. Okay, everyone, we're back to the fun part. We're back to the part where we get to plate whatever it is we made for dinner, right? So just so you remember what I made today, we made collard and turnip green a mix. I'm up here. My hair looks crazy now from all this work. We made collard and turnip green mix with a smoky flavor. We made macaroni that is Alfredo and other white cheeses and bacon flavored. And we made an Italian style flavoring wise meatloaf. Two Italian style meatloaf. And I put parchment paper under the foil to try to prevent the cheese from sticking. I still got a little bit of stick, but that's how you do things to keep your, keep your cheese where it's supposed to be. So the first thing we're going to show y'all, right? We have to show the cheese pull, don't we? Right? The cheese pull. <clears throat> so the first thing we're going to do, we're going to get us a nice portion of mac and cheese. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that greatness. That's important, right? It'll be a, have more of a pull even when it's a little colder. But that's that first. All right. Next thing we're going to put on our plate with a little bit of space here to work with is, and I had a knife already, can't find it, so we use a spatula. <clears throat> we want to get our sections, and the spatula actually is good too because it prevents you from cutting through your pan. All right, so you want to get a nice piece for your plating here of your meatloaf, right? Get a nice piece, and put it there like so. Now what I'm going to do, and I'm gonna bring it back so y'all can see it. <clears throat> and while I'm over here, I'm also gonna get the greens and go ahead and put them on the plate. The greens are cooked with some smoked meat here. Yum, yum. Try to drain as much of your green juice as possible so it doesn't interfere with your meatloaf and such. All right, get them on the plate. My boyfriend's not someone who's a green lover per se, so we're not gonna give him a lot, but we gotta get some on this plate because we wanna show it to y'all, right? And actually, I'm going to use my tongs to get these greens out because it's easier, quite honestly, it's just easier. You wouldn't think it is, but it is. Just when you're, especially if you're only giving someone a small amount of greens, there's no reason to give them like this, all uh, this like heaping pile. You're just grabbing a few leaves and putting them on the plate. I think that's plenty for him. Like I said, he's not a green lover. And then even again, just make sure we get any juice off that plate, drain it right back into that pot because we do not want it on the plate or any other pieces of food, right? <clears throat> so what you'll see now that I've done, and I'll raise this up a little bit now, is now, too much, now we've got the mac and cheese, the greens, meatloaf that I topped with some extra sauce, and then we're just going to add a few pieces of this toasted crostini. You probably need about four pieces for a plate this size. Put them on there as best you can. <clears throat> and you can garnish with parsley or you can garnish with fresh cilantro. I'm going to go parsley on this plate. <clears throat> now I'm going to take it off the tripod for our famous shot that we do. All right, so here is Sunday dinner. We got that beautiful Italian style meatloaf. We've got those seasoned crostinis. We've got Alfredo mac and cheese with bacon in it, topped with bacon cheese, cheese it's made into your breadcrumbs. And we've got our fresh parsley and collard green mix. No canned 
and vegetables on this plate. Macaroni and cheese also from scratch. The only thing I did not make, y'all, is those crustinis. Happy Sunday dinner.